see you guys in the dark. Being a paramedic means spending 99% of your time doing mundane, routine work involving transporting patients who aren't actually sick to and from the hospitals and their appointments. The other 1% seeing things that most humans never see. And pretending that you've seen these things a hundred times before and know exactly what to do about them. So this is exactly what I expected for my first day on the job. I had just finished my theory training and it was my first day on the job. I started at 0700 and met my training paramedic officer. I was young, naive, eager to learn, and all too concerned with checking the ambulance before we got the first big job. My training paramedic officer was concerned with making a good cup of coffee and sitting down to read his newspaper. Before we were rudely interrupted with this big job, at 0705, the phone had rang. John, my training paramedic officer, looked over at my excited expression and said that'll be the sign-on call, but it wasn't. We were called to a 16-year-old boy, found unconscious in the backyard after apparently being involved in the consumption of a lot of alcohol the night before, not breathing and without any pulse, while his brother was attempting CPR. John looked at me. Okay, here's your orientation to driving the lights and the sirens. As the passenger, your job is to watch for cars coming from the intersections on the left. Acknowledge whether to clear or to stop if you think a car is not going to stop. I'm not going to be looking on the left side, so if you want to avoid being hit by a car on your side, you better pay attention. I paid a lot of attention. As we rapidly progressed through the busy city streets, lights and sirens were blaring. I felt as though I was on a roller coaster ride for the first time in my life, and unable to interpret all the information that appeared to be buzzing in from all the directions, overtaking cars trucks, cyclists, you name it. Driving through red lights and listening to the multitude of cars driving by people not yet fully awake who are honking their horns in complaint of the vehicle in front, which has stopped for no apparent reason. Oblivious to the ambulance desperately making its way through. Trying to weave our way through a large procession of early morning city-dwelling pedestrians on their way to work with iPods in their ears, blissfully ignorant of the ambulance desperately trying to get through. John looks over at me. Do you acknowledge all of that? I feel like I've fallen asleep, and just woken up in the middle of giving a speech at the point in which I'm about to identify the brilliant solution, completely unaware of what I was meant to say. Acknowledge what, I ask him. John looks over at me very calmly. Weren't you paying attention to the radio? While trying to interpret all the other excessive information, my ears didn't mention to me that dispatch was giving me specific information about my patient. After all, I was still trying to remember how to set up the resuscitation equipment. John grabbed the radio and then acknowledged all the information. Suddenly, the ride had stopped. We were at the scene. There was a neighbor urgently waving both hands, as though his urging could somehow speed up our presence. We grabbed our gear and followed the man around the backyard. In the middle of the yard, we found a young man stiff as a rock, cold, and very clearly deceased from the night before. My training paramedic started to explain to me that this patient had obviously died during the night, and then proceeded to place the cardiac monitor dots on the patient. This was part of our policy, with any deceased patient to ensure that he or she was actually dead. We did this even in patients who had clearly been dead for some time and no amount of resuscitation efforts could ever help bring them back. To our surprise, the monitor starts to beep. The rhythm was almost completely normal. My training paramedic looked at me, as though somehow I had made a mistake putting on the ECG dots, as though it might be my fault, because obviously this patient was dead, and there could be no electrical activity anymore. No, the monitor doesn't lie. This person's heart was still firing its normal electrical currents but the heart just wasn't doing what it's supposed to, and it wasn't actually beating. We immediately start CPR, with me doing chest compression, and my training paramedic ventilating the patient. The intensive care paramedics then arrived, and while one of them inserted the ETD tube into the patient's trachea to breathe for him, another paramedic had started to insert adrenaline into the jugular. 
Within five minutes, the patient heart spontaneously started to beat on its own, and the patient had a good, strong pulse. We quickly loaded the patient into the ambulance. He started to moan, and then with both arms reached for the ET tube. Everyone talks about ambulance miracles, and this appeared to be one of them, because this guy was originally dead. I mean, his arms were that rigid when we got there that he couldn't move them at all. And now we were fighting him and trying to tell him not to pull the tube out because it was helping him. About five minutes from the hospital, the ambulance miracle ceased, and the monitor shows that the patient is now dead. He flatlined, like in the movies. CPR is immediately commenced, and the intensive care paramedic says to me, This is your baptism of fire, mate. Every paramedic's got to learn to do CPR in the back of a moving ambulance at one stage. The patient's condition remained unchanged. At the hospital, the medical team continued to work on the patient for another half hour and then pronounced him dead. I talked to the training paramedic while I was given the rookie job of cleaning the ambulance and resetting up all the equipment and asked what he thought had happened to the young man. Mate, there's another lesson for you. Sometimes the strangest things happen in this job, and that's all there is to it. No explanation, no rhyme or reason why one patient dies and another one gets to live. We responded to an apartment building when the caretaker had called us. The initial report was that he went to go check on a suite because water had been reported flooding into the hallway. He informed us that there was a deceased lady in the tub. He said that he saw her and immediately backed out without touching anything. We entered the suite, and it was filled with steam. The humidity had started peeling the paint off the walls and sheets. There was also the smell of cooked meat. Upon entering the bathroom... We found the supposed deceased seated in the tub, with the hot water running. From the looks of it, she had been there for a while. The skin on her body, all the way from the toes, had started separating, much like the paint on the walls. It was bubbled and coming up in sheets. I checked for vitals while someone turned off the water, and the other ones went to go get a bag and a radio for a can. When the body is completely decomposed, we put them in a sheet metal box. I almost shit myself when I found signs of life. The lady happened to have a pulse. She wasn't really responsive, but she was breathing shallow, had a heartbeat, and was looking at us. We had to get her out of there. We radioed for EMS and informed them we had a live patient with at least 80% burn. There were a few minutes out, and we started to get the patient ready for transport. I don't remember what we were doing when we noticed the water draining from the tub, What we saw was her torso essentially gloving itself as the water had receded. We immediately plugged the bathtub and then continued working her. When EMS arrived, we had to transfer her to the stretcher. That's where things got pretty ugly. Well, I planned to gently lift her out of the tub and place her on the stretcher. However, as soon as we touched her, her skin was coming off in sheets. I remember saying, I'm sorry, but we have to do this as I picked up my section and came away with almost all of the skin I contacted, stuck to my arms. That was the only time that she made any sound. She probably couldn't feel it due to the nerve damage, but I'm pretty sure she knew she had almost lost all of her skin from the chest down. The water was still extremely hot, so we were also getting burned while doing this. We managed to get her onto the stretcher, and EMS had taken her away. When the bathtub was drained, there was a sheet of it stuck to the bottom, We had to scrape it off and bag it. I still can't eat certain chicken dishes because of this. We figured she was in the tub, and water got cool. So she turned it on with her toes, but she must have had a stroke and couldn't turn it off once again. Being in an apartment, it had pretty much unlimited hot water. So that poor lady sat there for approximately three days, just cooking. She did not survive. We don't get a lot of follow-up calls, but I heard that she had passed away. Between a stroke and severe burns, it wasn't likely that she would make it, but we treat every patient like they have a chance. The human body is a weird and wonderful thing. Sometimes people do make it through some pretty terrible things. I had a call just after I came on duty of an elderly male with possible high fever. We didn't have much more information because of the caller, which was his elderly wife was, according to the dispatcher, hard to understand. Anyways, we head out there seven minutes or so later. As we get in, 
The wife is sitting at the kitchen table, just inside the door. So we ask her what's going on. She answers that he has been complaining. He is too hot all morning. We go into the next room, which is dark due to the curtains covering the windows. But there is enough light to see a dead man sitting in a chair. Now mind you, he was not recently dead. I'm talking blackened face, rot, rat bites around the mouth. Wasn't complaining this morning type of dead. I set down my equipment. My partner goes to turn on the light next to his chair, so we can verify the obvious. As she goes to reach for the light, the dead man groans and reaches for her hand. After collectively shitting our pants, we jump into action, come to find out he was on oxygen and a smoker. He was complaining about being hot because he was literally burning up. What looked like signs of death on his face were scorch marks and melted plastic. To answer the obvious question, I don't know. He was still alive when we got him in the hospital, and I never asked what happened to him after that. I work as an ICU nurse. A mid-twenties female came in with some serious cardiac abnormalities and went into respiratory distress. Never had any medical history at all. We had to put her on the ventilator, but she was just enough sedated to keep her lucid. She could nod or shake her head yes and no, apparently to questions. One night, the patient in the room next to hers had died, and the body was still in the room about to be taken to the morgue. The female patient's door was closed with the curtains drawn, so she couldn't have seen what was going on next door. When I went in to check on her, she had a look of sheer panic on her face, and trembling. I asked her a series of questions to see if she was cold, hot, in pain, stuff like that, and she denied all of it. I asked her if she saw something. She started to aggressively nod her head yes. She wasn't on any drugs that would make her hallucinate. I went on to get details on what this thing looked like. After playing 20 questions, I got this. It was a man, pale white, left arm was missing, heavy, bald, standing still, right behind me. This was the man who had just died next door. I had spent the rest of the night consoling her. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, like, and hit the bell for notifications on future videos and become a stalker of the night, and I'll see you next time.